Hi everyone, welcome back to the Mentors Connect podcast. I'm your host Chloe and today on the podcast we have Gavin Smith who is the president and chairman of the Australian division for Bosch which is a major company. We've all heard about it and they are major innovators utilizing engineering technology to create solutions. So today I'm really excited to talk to Gavin and learn more about Bosch, how sustainability technology is changing their business. So thank you, Gavin, so much for meeting me again. You're very welcome, Chloe. Nice to be here. So but just before we get started with the questions, I was hoping if you could tell us a bit about yourself and how you found your way to this amazing position. Sure. Well, I've been with the company since 1990, so this year is my 32nd year in the firm. And to be honest, I got there quite by accident. I was working in another multinational in uh, an information technology role, and it was horrible, to be honest. So um, I saw an ad for Bosch in the, the newspaper back in the days. That's where you look for jobs. And they were looking for someone to work on a three-month contract to help them implement a new system um, at their site out in Clayton. So I applied, I was interviewed, and they said, yeah, come and work for us. Uh, we need you for three months. And here I am 32 years later, still in the same firm, clearly no longer on a three-month contract, but um, I had the first approximately seven years working for the company in IT roles. Then I moved into what's called automotive original equipment sales. Wow. And that took me to Germany for a couple of years. And after working for the company based in Frankfurt, I came back to Australia and I've had a, a series of promotions and additional responsibilities added. And in 2011, when the, um, the head of the company here uh, was due to retire, they asked me if I'd take on the role and I was delighted. And in fact, I'm the first local appointee to the position of chairman and president of the company and the company's oh, 70 year history. So uh -huh. I, I no, feel that's quite funny though, because my family and I, when I was like, I was like, you know, is Gavin German? But that's called your Aussie. Mm. It's like, that doesn't sound like a German name. But no. I, no, be careful. Be careful. I'm, I'm low. I say it, I'm local. That doesn't mean I'm Australian. Oh. So I have an Australian passport, um, but I lived in New Zealand for 10 years. I have New Zealand oh. citizenship and You're passport, Kiwi. but I'm actually British. I'm actually British. British. Oh. So I was born in Scotland. I carry a British passport, a New Zealand passport and an Australian passport. The, uh, the renewal fees are a bit horrendous. To oh, be honest, but, uh, gosh, they come, I can imagine. They come in handy. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Three months turned to 32 years. And obviously now we're going to have a chat today and I want to get it started on our questions. So first, day, mm. I wanted to ask you how tech is shaping the future of like manufacturing. I understand that Bosch utilizes a lot of technology, but how has this changed the way mm. you've been able to build your systems and solutions? Yeah. Well, I might start, Chloe, with doing a bit of a, a bit of a look over the shoulder, if you don't mind. So the steam agent, the steam engine, the age of science and mass production and the rise of digital technology are referred to individually as developments that brought about the first three industrial revolutions. Mm -hmm. But we're now at the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution. There's another technological development which is giving rise to this. And this fourth industrial revolution Sometimes we paraphrase and we describe it as industry 4.0. You know, it's the hip expression. But industry 4.0 has at its core the growing network of internet-enabled devices, creating what is broadly termed the Internet of Things or IoT. You might have heard of it. I'm sure you've read about it. They might even be teaching it at schools these days. Um, and it's important to understand that, you know, by 2025, there will be more than 64 billion billion connected devices to the internet. Mm -hmm. So in the past where the internet's been used for browsing and surfing and information sharing, now it's a way of connecting devices and getting data to and from them. And this connectivity means that factories, cities, homes, and in fact, almost everything will become smarter. This, this connectivity and the enabling of connectivity in billions of devices though, would be completely pointless if we didn't have multi gigabit per second data speed, ultra low latency and high reliability of fixed as well as 5G mobile networks. And that's what allows them to seamlessly connect and transfer data. These networks now enable the integration of miniature sensors in every asset and in every process that was not previously possible. In the factory and across the supply chain, these sensors allow us to capture every conceivable type of data 
en masse and in real time. That data, which is often stored in the cloud or in massive servers, can then be correlated with other available data sets. It can be interrogated, analyzed, but more importantly, we can apply artificial intelligence models and machine learning algorithms to make sense of the data and give us previously unimaginable insights about the asset and its operations. So this allows immediate and often self-determined changes in operation and use. The machines are controlling the machines where to date it's needed people to do that. So imagine a production machine that can predict when it's going to break down and then call for maintenance but not just call for the maintenance, do it at the optimum time that limits any disruption. Or think about a factory that produces, say, sunscreen that can scale up or ramp down its production by itself based on the weather forecast and the visibility of the movement of product on its customer shelves. So if you combine those aspects with increasing levels of automation in factories, assembly robots that can work in close proximity with humans, we call them cobots, autonomous guided vehicles that deliver parts just in time to assembly processes, and new manufacturing techniques like 3D printing that can produce low volume parts that would normally require expensive and long lead time processes. So we can now achieve unprecedented levels of efficiency and reliability and at the same time, more customizable products, high quality and with shorter lead times than ever before. That's and with everything connected, yeah, sorry to interrupt. No. And with everything connected, we can, we can model our production processes as what we call a digital twin of the real thing. So there's the real, and then there's a the digital version of it. And we can then modify and change processes in that model and see what it means. So for Bosch, we're doing all of those things. We're applying all of that capability across our more than 128 manufacturing plants. We're implementing industry four solutions and techniques and with some of our plants now so advanced, we're winning significant awards and kudos for significant changes and growing efficiency in the manufacturing environment. It's a really exciting time, Chloe. That's absolutely unbelievable. That's so cool. Oh my goodness, that must be so exciting to be also a part of that environment. So oh, now it's, it's great. Now I wanted to continue on and talk a bit about how sustainability is changing the way Bosch is doing mm -hmm. business. Yeah, so Bosch has always had an eye on balancing economic and environmental outcomes. Uh, since 2018 though, we set ourselves a tough challenge and that was to be the first industrial company of size to become carbon neutral. And when we talk about carbon neutrality, you might know there are three measures, scope one, scope two and scope three. So our first target, was to be neutral at scope two by the end of 2020. And we achieved that, the first industrial company okay. to be so certified. And Bosch is massive. But in, That's just a massive job. Yeah, we are. I mean, the, the, Bosch, the Bosch group ranks in the top 100 firms worldwide, more than 400,000 people, 130 odd production locations, uh, 120 billion Australian dollars in revenues. To be carbon neutral worldwide within two years of the target being set is remarkable. But there's more than that. Every new product we develop has to meet tough life cycle metrics under our design for environment guidelines. And we also exclude the use of any harmful materials. So there are standards that we have to comply with, but we typically go far beyond that. Our next challenge, Chloe, though, is to further reduce our carbon emissions. And this time it's is relative to what we call scope three. And scope three includes um, many things which are outside our direct control. So our target here is to cut emissions by 15% by 2030. It's a massive challenge. We actually have to account for the carbon emissions of our suppliers. Mm -hmm. So the things that we buy, their carbon footprint comes into our scope three emissions. And also the products that we manufacture and sell to, for example, consumers, be it household appliances, a dishwasher, a microwave, an oven, or a power tool, any of the things that we supply. In our carbon emissions calculation, we're responsible for the emissions from the energy generated that powers those devices for the life of them. And we have to compensate for that as well. So, you know, for a company like ours, uh, scope two emissions is about one one hundredth of the total emissions that we are responsible for. And we now have to focus on the, the other 99%. 
So it's a big challenge, but it's an important one. And it's one that we do not shy away from. No, well, that's amazing. You know, I think that also shows how you guys were able to achieve that goal in two years. When you put your mind to something, you can do it, can't you? Absolutely right. The, now, the, the toughest thing is to make a commitment and get started. Yeah. After that, it just runs. Awesome. So and now I, I wanted to continue on a bit. So I've seen the ads and I absolutely love the ads of live sustainable like hashtag hashtag like a Bosch. And you know, mm. this is this rhetoric of obviously wanting sustainability and goods. So this is really the future Bosch sees um consumers wanting sustainably thought about products and considered products? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's more prevalent in the younger generations, to be honest. Um, you, you would probably have a much better idea about the environment. You'd be more environmentally conscious than someone who's in their 40s and 50s. Um, you've learned about it differently. You, you have different perspectives. So you will make your purchasing decisions differently than someone who's at the other age, for example. But it's becoming more of a movement, I'd have to say. Consumers are becoming more savvy. Consumers better understanding the impact that um, products and the production of them has on the environment. And they're making decisions because of that. No, and also just some feedback. I love the ad for hashtag like a Bosch. Smart. Mm. We've got, <laughs> yeah, we've got lots of like a Bosch advertising campaigns yeah. all the way from internet of things to work like a Bosch, manufacture like a Bosch. Um, you name it. It's a good one. I love it. <laughs> but now continuing on, I wanted to talk about it because obviously Bosch, you also sell a lot of goods that are available to the everyday consumer, not just big companies mm. with their big, awesome machines. So would you say yeah. like the future of purchasing these goods, you know, for like the everyday consumer like me, is that like, is the brick and mortar store gone or do you think it's going to be purely online or and here I, here I can turn the podcast around. What do you prefer? Do you prefer buying online or do you prefer buying in bricks and mortar or do you like choosing one or the other depending on what the product is and how much you need to see it, feel it, touch it, try it before you commit to it? Yeah, I think it depends on the cost. Like if I was paying $1,000 for something, I'd want to have seen it, you know, in the flesh like right there before I made a purchase. But I think, mm. you know, you obviously would all know this, but... um people, I guess, would go to the store, probably have a look at it and then go proceed and buy it online and get it all shipped easily to their house. Yeah. And I think what, what you're saying mirrors what we have learned and what we've understood as well. We've got customers that were pure online plays where they had no bricks and mortar stores at all. And they are now opening bricks and mortar stores. Mm -hmm. And we've got others who are pure bricks and mortar businesses that have built an online presence. So what we see is a coexistence and companies typically will choose one or the other or a blend of both. And what we're recognizing is that it's very, very relevant to the product, the purchasing experience and the decision making process that people go through. So, you know, if you can go to a showroom and see a product, do you need to buy it there or mm -hmm. could you just buy it online? If you want to buy consumables. For example, we all know that A2 milk is A2 milk. So why don't we just buy that online from the supermarket and have it delivered? Um, there's a percentage of people that do, but there's a large percentage that still like to go to the supermarket and do their grocery shopping that way. I saw a lot of so people think today at the supermarket. <laughs> did you? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's absolutely horses for courses, but I think the days of the brick and mortar store are not over, not by a long way. Oh, no, thank you so much, Gavin, for your time today and sharing with all of us your amazing insights and a bit about your background. It's been a really, really great discussion. You're very welcome, Chloe. It's good to be with you.